Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit, the newest and most reliable state-of-the-art time-traveling transportation service, is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Odyssey. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 9 of the podcast. This week, my guest is Dr. Clifford Ando, the David B. and Clara E. Stern Distinguished Service Professor who currently holds a dual appointment as a professor in the departments of Classics and History at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on the histories of religion and law and government in the ancient world. He writes and advises on topics related to provincial administration, the relationship between imperial power and local culture change, and the form and structure of ancient empires. He has also written extensively on ancient religion. Together, we did a mini deep dive into the true value of a personal statement in a grad school application, examined the social and political arguments for funding the humanities, and talked a little about the authenticity versus accuracy aspect of adapting ancient material for film and TV. Uh, There's a lot to unpack here, so take care, enjoy the episode, and I will speak to you all next time. All right, so I want to thank you for joining me once again on this uh, beautiful morning. Um, So I was wondering if you would be able to start out by just telling me a little bit about how you got interested in classics, whether that was in college, whether that was way before. Um, It's 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 such a niche subject that I'm I'm really interested in, in hearing how every person finds it where they are in their journey, their age. Right. That, uh, I mean, an, an excellent question, because uh, as a professor of classics, you know, of course, I meet a fair number of undergraduate and graduate students um, who are passionate about the subject, and they, they themselves bring to these conversations a wide variety of stories about how they came to the field. You know, there, there might be a number of fairly standard tropes about one would be reading Latin, another would be encountering, say, Greek myth, You know, there are some number, particularly in the United States, more than in Europe, who come to it via an encounter with uh, something like the the world of early Christianity and so forth. In in my case, although I did take some Latin in middle school, when it was required in my middle school of seventh and eighth graders, the, the, the move into classics occurred in stages, as I suppose it necessarily will, right? Because an undergraduate major is not the same thing as going to graduate school, which is not the same thing as making it your career. Um, the, the move into classics was uh, aided, made possible, perhaps perhaps made inevitable by a series of encounters with some very sympathetic and understanding teachers. So when I went to my undergraduate institution, I got some letter late in the spring Um, before I matriculated, to the effect that the university was starting up a set of what they called freshman seminars, small seminars, I think of a dozen people. There were going to be three or four of them offered that the following year, and one applied to join. They were supposed to be kind of selective versions and boutique classes and um, with with famous teachers or however however they were described to us now a very long time ago. Um, And I I applied to one of these on a topic I knew absolutely nothing about, but which sounded intriguing. I I think it had a title like Shamans in Greek Religion. And it was taught by a very wonderful professor, as I discovered, named Bob Connor, W. Robert Connor. Um, And uh, I, I, I could tell a long tale about it, but I had a wonderful time. And I was not a particularly, um, a uh, distinguished student in, in, in my first year. I, I took a lot of classes, I should say. I mean, I was never a bad student, but I was very busy my first year. Students will be, the material seemed difficult. I didn't really know anything of it's a, a sign. I didn't really know anything about either the Greek world or Greek religion. Um, everyone else seemed to have read things about religion or myth or whatever. And then there was all this kind of, you know, readings and in particular kinds of secondary literature about structuralism and so forth, which which left me completely confounded. And at a moment late in the term in preparing to write, in essence, something like the single graded assignment, a 
kind of one big paper, which is a kind of big deal for the one's first term in college. The professor, Bob Connor, helped me out both in kind of crafting a topic and then in helping me locate readings. And I went away and did enormous amounts of work because I didn't want to embarrass myself yet further in this class. And I, 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 the, the paper turned out well. Um, he wrote a very nice comment. And uh, I suppose, you know, I, having been affirmed, I, I think how many people end up doing things like this in, as undergraduates, having been affirmed once, I then said, well, okay, I'll, I'll take another class in that department. And, uh, you know, and, and, and so it went. And because that class had been in Greek, and I, this is, I'll, I'll make, tell one more quick story just by way of um, illustrating my own trajectory. Because that first class had been in Greek material, I spent a very great portion of my undergraduate quote unquote classics career studying Greek stuff, Greek history. I took some class on Alexander with Eric Gruen. I did this, I did that. and. Um, then in my senior year uh, as an undergraduate, my department hosted two visiting professors who were both, you know, I thought then, and I, I think now as a professional, really quite extraordinarily skilled at what they do, but also very lovely people. Uh, Tony Woodman was a, a Latinist and Brent Shaw was an historian. And uh, I thought that their, their work, I thought the, the experience of their classes was extraordinary. And so I went off and I applied to graduate school and my application said something close to almost the entirety of my coursework is in Greek, but I just took these two, two very cool classes in, in Latin and Roman history, and I would like to come to graduate school and, and, and do Roman things. Um, and I have the feeling that this was not an entirely persuasive application. I was, you know, I was, I was essentially, I must have looked fickle. I was you know, declaring a passion for something that I knew precious little about. Um, uh, but you know, I, 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 that's, that, that was another shift. And there was a kind of further one in graduate school, um, with the aid of a professor I had there named Sabina McCormack, but there was a set of teachers that were really extraordinarily instrumental, both in the choice of classics and, and in, and in shifts in direction my, my career took in classics. Um, and I, you know, I think it would be, it would be entirely appropriate to give them credit. It was not out of some inner drive on my own part. Well, I congratulate you for, for getting into grad school because I, I I feel like I would have come up against something very similar, although I, I can't say as though I, I took classes perhaps in my final year uh, or so of, of schooling uh, that would have said, made me say, oh, yes, I'm going to just go and do this and, and hope for the best. But um, I, I sort of had the, the more broad I, I like this generally, but I don't have a specific idea of a topic that I'd like to take and specialize in. Uh, and then I felt that I just, I waited so long that I was like, oh, no one's going to want to take me in their grad program. So I'm just not going to apply. Never mind. I'll, I'll do something else uh, and then proceeded to do something else. I'm deeply sympathetic to that feeling on your part. Um, I, there are a number of things about I don't know, it's not just classics. So let's just say about how educational institutions let people through the door. Both college admissions and graduate school admissions. But taking graduate school as the case in point, because you know, that's where we are in the conversation, right? We, we ask people to write personal statements and we expect that the personal statement will contain not just a general description of enthusiasm or an account of them as an intellect, hard as such a thing would be to write, but we expect it to contain a kind of declaration of interest. This is the field in which you wish to work. This is the topic you wish to pursue. And at the same time, I'm sure a fair number of the faculty who read these things would say, oh no, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want Cliff to be working on the same thing after three years here that he, he said he wanted to work on because we would expect that as he encounters more of the ancient world in terms of evidence, as he meets people with new forms of expertise and new theoretical commitments compared to what he has in undergraduate, we want him to grow and move on. You shouldn't be working on the same thing at 24, quote unquote, the same thing in 24 that you were at 20. Uh, so on the one hand, there's a kind of a framework within people in, 
when we think about students, we meaning faculty, think about students. And we, we actually, we don't expect the, the personal statement. It's not a binding commitment. And we'd be vaguely disappointed if it turned out to be binding. At the same time, we, we don't take that little bit of knowledge and go back and tell people, oh, oh, sorry, not tell people. We don't go back and revise the whole system of application, which we could do, right? No one goes, but we don't actually take the personal statement seriously. Or we read the personal statement. You could certainly say, we read the personal statement looking for different information than the people who write the personal statement seek to put into it. And maybe we should, maybe we should achieve a greater alignment between what we're looking for in the statement and what the people think they should put in the statement. But we don't do that. We still have these, we, we still expect people and people still write them declaring, you know, I have my dissertation topic, you know, I am 20 and this is what I'm going to work on for the rest of my life. And uh, no, that's, that's a completely unreasonable thing to ask people to do. And yeah, and, then, and, and so, if, you know, if, if somebody like you feels, you know, if somebody like you feels um, put off by an, that kind of expectation, well, then, you know, that, that could well turn out to be a loss. People should think that take that seriously. Well, and that kind of bleeds into the larger problem of just sort of accessibility. I feel like there's so many artificial barriers that we put up for ourselves within the field, which is just so unfortunate. Um, usually when I think of accessibility issues, I'm thinking of how do we get people uh, to even do the undergrad major in it first off because a lot of people will just say oh no I uh, I don't know if I want to go to grad school because I'd have to if I want to make it a career and then you get some version of but I want to make money okay I don't want to be poor so I don't want to do that um, but I think you bring up a very good point because a lot of people don't think of the additional accessibility issue of okay so you say I'm going to get I whatever I don't care I'm gonna get this undergrad major which I did and then yeah by the time you get ready to when people are just sort of asking you around senior year hey have you thought about grad school you, you know you seem to have most of the requirements what are you gonna do um for me it was pretty easy um I had some weird quirks with my schedule so I did not have the language requirements needed to get into a grad program um usually I think it's what is it three three semesters of one language two of the other ancient something like that yeah, there's an ex there's it varies from program to program I'm sure but there's a there's a kind of framework of expectations and you're absolutely right it's measured in something like years of one language and years of the other yeah yeah so luck maybe not luckily but I, I I didn't have to make that choice because I did not have all the language requirements that would have even let me into a program so I just said that's fine I, I have other interests and I'm going to go do them um, because I enjoy them anyway so I, I felt I was okay but had I had the languages I still would have come up against the same issue which um, I still in a way have come up against now which is I'm thinking oh I'd like to maybe get back into some sort of grad program I don't know if it would necessarily be classics I've always always loved Egyptology uh, but looking at oh how do I do and can I still do an MA in that what would I need to do um, my background didn't need me to take Middle Egyptian so is it possible to just start studying now in a two-year program um, and while that's a certainly a an option I suppose anyone if, if they're really motivated enough can do um, most of the time it would come down to this really big um, question of yes per personal statements because uh, I would tell professors I it's not that I wasn't a motivated student in undergrad not at all um, pretty much every class within my major I was excellent in uh, it, it's really the gen eds that killed me because I have always struggled with math and science and I've just objectively been horrendous at them never succeeded so I always say oh no it, it brought my GPA down so I, I'm not going to have that three seven that you would like to to see if I was applying to your program so I would always say well what can I do to stand out um, do I need to be one of those people who says I know my dissertation topic I know what I'm going to do I'm I'm going to sound impressive so you have to take me uh, and most of the time I, I get some form of, well, okay, well, we, we sort of pay attention to the GPA, but it's not everything because you don't need math. We don't care about math, but yeah. yes, make sure you craft a very strong statement of intent. And I'm like, okay, I don't, 
I don't know what you're looking for. I don't know what's supposed to go into this. So then I always get caught up in the, so am I going to tell them what I think my dissertation topic is going to be? Like, do I have to just sound super motivated, like convincing them you should take me, even though I probably have no idea what on earth I'm going to do? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll give a quick reply, but to, to a kind of really powerful topic, as, as you've laid it out. One is that the, my first thought is a kind of optimistic one, and then I'll move on to the pessimistic version. But the, the optimistic one is that um, people should keep in mind that I think, and I've, I've spent at least a little bit of time as a visitor in a fair number of other academic systems, you know, in Canada, New Zealand, England, Germany, France, various places I've been a, a visiting faculty member, you know, always a visitor, it's not, not, not like I am have deep, deep, deep knowledge, but I have some knowledge. And uh, the United States academic system is more open or has more entry points, might be a better way to put it, than anywhere else I know of. So that, and I say this in particular just in respect to something like undergraduates getting in, because I'll come to the pessimistic point in a moment. But, but I do want to affirm the optimistic version which is that although there's a kind of a norm that people do well in high school or try in high school and they proceed more or less, more or less directly from high school into quote unquote college or university or whatever, and that they're then in university for four years rather than five or six or so forth. Um, in point of fact, the United States makes it possible in a way that very few other countries do for people later to get a high school equivalency degree, for people to enhance their, their, their pre-university credentials via something like community college to get back into many state systems and you know, and after working for some years. You know, I, I know a fair number of people, this would be true of a prior generation of very intelligent women who maybe had an undergraduate degree but actually went back to graduate school once their, once their children were out of the house. So, you know, went back as my, my grandmother did um, and so on. And I know a fair number of people who did this. So a, a positive reaction to what you say and to your concern that say, I mean, say in your case, you're now in the workforce is that in many, many ways, the United States system provides an extraordinary array of entry points that it, if, it, if at virtually any point in your life in the United States, you really want to commit to education, there will be a way in. That said, you know, it, it's harder when you're kind of seeking to re-enter at a more specialized point. And, and here, I'll speak about the humanities because that's what we're talking about. Um, I think the problem exists in different ways in different fields, but let's just say classics. But since you mentioned Egyptology, we can toss in Egyptology or more broadly, um, let's include something like area studies, of which classics was not originally an area study. It has a, oh dear. you know, these area studies, classics. So let's, let's pretend that classics is something like Mediterranean studies. So, you know, Mediterranean studies, classics, Near Eastern studies, which includes Egyptology, East Asian, all of these things, you know, there are, for specialized study, there turn out to be prerequisites in the form of language acquisition. And, and we, I think some of like people who take them seriously, we don't want to give up on those because, you know, um, you need, there's a scientific reason, but there are also kind of political and ethical reasons to respect the particularity of ancient ancient and for that matter, other languages that turn out to be things that you say and craft and ways of speaking in other languages that are not captured in translation. Um, I, we could talk more about that, but I, I think it's just true. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to say that certain kinds of expertise or research in a field are possible unless you, unless you can get closer to the forms of expression of, that the people you're studying use. You, you want to encounter them insofar as possible on their own terms. I mean, you can never get there. You and I are not ancient Greeks and you and I are not ancient Romans uh, and you're not an ancient Egyptian, but you wanna get there or you wanna get as close as possible. 
but um, when in your life are you going to, you know, there's the truth that between the late 1960s and early 1970s, Greek and Latin ceased to be taught widely in American secondary schools. Egyptian probably was never widely taught. Uh, you know, Sanskrit, Sanskrit or Hittite or Akkadian or Tamil are languages that, you know, you encounter um, essentially at high level undergraduate institutions. Um, not even at all kind of American undergraduate institutions, but usually the, the more rarefied the language, the rarer it's going to be in the landscape. And um, how, how fields, how institutions should think about the provision of specialized education um, in light of that fact is, is very, very difficult. I mean, you, you, you could, in, 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 in Chicago's Near Eastern Studies Department, there are languages that they offer essentially only at a graduate level. So they know if they take a graduate student to work on certain types of Anatolian history in the second and early first millennium BCE, you're not going to get people who know these languages when they apply to graduate school. You're going to have to train them in the languages upon arrival. That lengthens time to degree. It increases the risk when you take them. What if they turn out not to be terribly good at those languages? Um, it also, I mean, I'm speaking from the point of view of the institution. What about you? You know, what about the 21 year old who's taking up, who, who wants to take up this field? You know, I, I would like to generally to avoid kind of instrumental economic language, but I'll descend into it for one moment, right? It turns out, it's a simple math problem. It turns out that saving money, earning money in your 20s is important for people's later economic life. Um, uh, and when you, let us say, invite people to graduate school. When you invite people to spend their 20s acquiring rarefied humanistic knowledge in the form of ancient languages, um, you know, you're helping that, you're helping somebody to make a kind of very serious life choice whose consequences may not be entirely visible to the 21 year old who's applying to graduate school, but it's a real one. It's a, it's a non, it's a non-trivial commitment of years of their lives with ramifications later on. Um, and that commitment is longer. It's just, I mean, quite apart from whether you think law or medicine is instrumentally more useful than humanities, the degree is going to take longer. In a PhD in Near Eastern Studies, it's gonna take longer in a PhD in anthropology than it would for a three-year degree in law. And what do we make of that? It's complicated because I, I suppose, as just such a huge proponent of the humanities, because I'm all for people doing backgrounds and specialized degrees in the humanities, but I would say most people do not share my view, I find, but I say it's a, it's a better, it's, it's a bigger upfront investment in time and years spent not in the workforce, not saving up for retirement per se, um, but I would say over the the light over a person's lifetime, it's going to be a a better long term investment. Um, you're going to know how to be a critical thinker. You're going to you're going to learn how to read really efficiently. You're going to be able to talk to people, um, have great interpersonal skills, uh, and other things, uh, as well as just being great at research, which is always a very handy skill. But um, yeah, that might not be able to be showcased in a way right away, uh, especially depending on when you go out, do you want to teach? Okay, there's not very many teaching positions uh, that, that just sort of are available. So then you might have to wait. Um, you might have to take a position as a at a junior college first, or if you're really desperate and you're like, well, I have the languages, I could be a Latin high school teacher for a little while, Some something. Um, sure, we, we like to romanticize getting law degrees or being business majors, something very flashy. Um, but that sort of strips out the idea that you have to be very innovative, very entrepreneurial, honestly. I, okay, you have a business degree, you got to do something with it. You get, you still have to be smart. You have to, you have to be personable. People have to like you, invest in whatever you're trying to do. Um, and, and anyway, I think you can teach people these skills uh, at any point in life. 
but you, I, I, I personally just believe it's very, it's not the easiest thing to teach people how to, to think and read and condense and, um, and, and talk to people. It's, I don't, I, 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 I agree with you. I, I think it's a change that's occurred in the United States over the last, let's say, 30 or so years, maybe 40, maybe it begins something like, yeah, I guess I'm getting older. So I'd have to admit that it's 40. It essentially, you know, essentially is a change that you might associate with the ushering in of Reaganism in the United States and in, in Thatcher's generation in the UK, in which you could describe it in one way in economic terms and in another way in, the, in our kind of ideology of education. And in economic terms, we began to withdraw public support of education. We, we ceased, to, we ceased as, a, as two countries to commit to university level education as a public good. And we began to treat it more as a kind of good that accrued to the private individual person who was undertaking the education. And so we began, you know, the, 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 the contribution to public institutions, the University of Illinois, University of California, whatever, the contribution to public institutions of, um, of state revenue diminished rapidly to the point where the big, big institutions, Berkeley, Michigan, so on, you know, get 8, 10, 11% of their revenue from the state now. This is tiny. We still call them public universities, but people should know that they're not public in that sense. Um, and alongside that reconception of how we should finance them, as I say, went this kind of vision that, you know, this is not having a broadly educated citizenry was no longer an aspiration of the country. Instead, you know, you, Cliff, or you, Lexi, were going out and getting something that was supposed to be good for you. Well, what is that good? And the, the quickest, easiest, you know, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get polemical, the laziest answer was that it was an economic good, that um, uh, you, and, it, it, and universities are guilty of playing along with this because universities, universities took this little nugget of information that if you have a BA, you're gonna make more money than if you were at a high school degree, which was true in 1980, and it's more true now because of the collapse of unionized labor. Um, so, you know, uh, the kinds of work you can get with a high school degree have decreased in their economic power and knowledge-based careers have increased in economic power. So if anything, it looks like an even better argument today that university education is good for you financially. Um, but I think it's a huge cop-out for us to say that our object as colleges and universities is to form economic beings. That is not all we're doing. And if all we're doing is forming economic beings, sure, abandon much of the humanities. Because I think humanists who go out and say, oh no, you know, writing is going to be good for you, that's a losing argument. You're, you're just gradually, you're going to say, okay, then we need a couple people to teach a gen ed class on writing, and you should all, the rest of you should go away. But you know, frankly, we should never we should never have fallen back on a kind of narrow argument of instrumental utility. We're not teaching people to be economic beings. That's a stupid thing to say. Um, if that's all universities are, we've lost the argument already. So this, this brings up a really good point. How, how do we win this back? Because now you've mentioned, you know, funding is the perpetual issue. And one of the barriers, the, the, another artificial barrier that I see all the time that we throw up, especially for anyone interested in any of the ancient fields, mm -hmm. um, is they are often limited to the most exclusive institutions in the country. So if I wanted to go study Egyptology, like I thought when I was in sixth grade, I would have had to go to UCLA, Harvard, Brown, Yale, some of these places where I was like, I, one, I, I don't think, I don't know if I can get in, but two, they're really expensive. Do I have the money to get in? Do my parents? Obviously, when you're young, you don't think financially too much unless you're very, um, yeah. conscientious about it. But for me, I, at least as a 12 year old who just loved everything, Egypt and ancient Greece, I, I had no idea. And so when it came time to applying to, to universities, I said, well, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hope, and I'm gonna think that classics hopefully is, is popular enough that most institutions will have at least a classics department. If I can't just do a BA straight up in Egyptology, which 
luckily most most places have at least a classics department in some way shape or form how big it is is another issue but so i ended up going to mizzou and they did have a decently smallish sized department i think we had 10 faculty like some i don't know it was it was small there were maybe 40 people in the department um total for for a big school like mizzou that's i i can't compare there's some really small colleges around that that probably have much smaller uh, faculty and, and student bases. But um, from my perspective, that's just what we had. And I said, okay, well, this is nice. It's smallish, sort of middle-sized, but ah, oh, man, I would love to, to see more people involved. I'd love to see more faculty. I'd love to see 200 students come through our department, uh, which in other countries is a little more realistic. Um, I have a friend who's a tour guide in Greece uh, who, uh, who was on the podcast, a, a early on and uh, I remember he was talking about education in Greece and when I asked him how uh, you become a tour guide he just said well you know people just go and get their degrees in archaeology whatnot and I said okay well how many people do that oh 200 oh that's a thing what I'd never heard of that so I we've become so economical in so many discussions around Education, which is so sad. I I just don't think education should be political at all. Um, but um, is there a way to sort of reverse these trends of of just this exclusivity for a lot of these vital fields for just making good humans, smart humans, to improve our society later, not the immediate financial payoff? Yeah. So let me mention two things quickly and then we can see where that takes us. One is, I believe I read at some point an interesting account of the distribution of undergraduate majors at various kinds of institutions. I could seek to find this for you after we finish. Um, uh, among other things, to confirm my memory of it. And you know, across the last decade or so, this data I do know exists and I could provide it to you, you know, there's been a, you know, there, there's a, a national database of information produced by the Department of Education called the IPEDS database. Um, and it basically the requirement is that any institution that receives any, any federal funding of any kind must surrender data, sort of data along certain axes to the federal government. And they compile this into a big database of information on um, educational institutions, including post-secondary institutions of colleges and universities. and um, this data, and because something like every institution gets federal money somehow, um, this data is incredibly complete and interesting. And a lot of things they can tell you things about like what percentage of students or number of students are requiring BAs in certain fields. And the answer is that um, in the humanities over the last 10 years or so, it's been pretty awful. And uh, I mentioned this because uh, I believe I recall that at certain kinds of institutions, in particular military academies, the humanities are doing just fine. And what to make of this data, and the interpretation I saw, which I think makes sense, is something like, if, if the people in the undergraduate institution feel strongly that they have a guaranteed career, then their elective choice is often enough to study the humanities. It's when people feel that their economic future is precarious and they're worried about it that they rush to choose an undergraduate major that they think is going to line their pockets. So then the question is, which is the cart and which is the horse? By making undergraduate institutions so expensive, undergraduate education period, by making undergraduate education so expensive and forcing people to take out loans, we have encouraged them that the whole thing should feel incredibly risky and fraught. And then as a consequence of that, earlier decision, as a consequence of that, then they choose STEM or business. I mean, maybe they actually love it. I don't want to do, I don't, I don't want to discount the possibility that there are a fair number of people who actually do love those fields. My brother's a mathematician. My father was an economist. My, one of my sons is a, is a computer scientist. But um, we created the context in which this generation feels education to be 
in their both intellectually but also economically, it feels precarious. Their their lives are they genuinely are economically precarious. We have forced the current generation to, of students to live through two economic crises. I mean, is it all that surprising um, that they that they worry about the consequences of the courses they study and the majors they choose? So you know that that's that's a kind of general point, and then a kind of a specific point about it. Um, you know, as a as a response, there are kind of two answers one might make. One is what what, what should institutions institutions do talking to the world, and then another is what should people do when talking to students. Big universities and colleges, let us say the, the, the research institutions, the top 40 or 50 institutions, by no means all, but they help to shape the public imagination. Right? When people want to talk about what is education for, I mean, I, I don't want to be mean about it, but when people want to talk about what, what education is for, they talk, they, you know, they get quotations from people like, you know, Columbia or Harvard or Michigan or Berkeley or, you know, university, the, the you know, Penn State. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why they ought to talk to people at various kinds of community colleges, but let's say that the, sh the shape of the national conversation is determined by the top institutions, top 30 or 40, probably even smaller number than that, but by the big one. You know, they should make a more robust public claim that it'll take a long time to make it stick. That the job of the university is to study um, something like, let us choose the humanities, to study the totality of something like human experience and cultural production. We are, I mean, take, moving into ancient studies or to historical studies or area studies, you know, our job is not um, to select out some aspects of human experience as particularly instrumentally useful going forwards and to focus on that. Our job is to respect the historical archeology span of human societies and to make that knowledge available and to make particular analyses available to future generations. Um, that's what the research university is for. And that, that just is expensive and we should do that. A collective society that a society that as a collectivity makes the choice to become ignorant around it about its own past is um, not a society in which any of us wishes to live. And the university is one of the sites. Universities, museums, things like that, libraries are the, are the tools that our society has crafted to, um, to learn about and transmit um, the knowledge of itself, knowledge of its past self to its future self. I, and then we, we could take this further. We could talk about how how we should talk to students, but that would be. And I, I said I would, but I realized that um, I don't want to. I don't want to give. I don't want my answers to be too wildly long. But that would be one response to what what you know how we should talk about. It. And I don't. I don't pretend that making such an argument in public is going to win the day, right away. Um, all of these, the the defunding of universities was a long battle, and the refunding of universities is going to be a long battle. For sure, for sure. I mean, these are incredibly complex issues, which no one's going to have a perfect answer sort of right away. But um, these are just very long term, very deep rooted issues, though, that, you know, I, I feel really and unless you're deeply, deeply involved with academia or just a very passionate uh, advocate for education, mm -hmm. most people tend to think about these things and say, oh, yeah, it's a surface issue. Let's add it to all the long list of other uh, issues that, that we feel we see in today's society. So, um, yeah, I... I These are questions that I've been asking myself for a long time, essentially. Um, but... Okay, so so I want to rewind a little. I love everything about where we were just at, but uh, to rewind just a little. So I I know that you specialize in ancient political thought, um, and I was just I was curious how you developed and curated that interest in that uh, specific area because I only had one professor in undergrad who did any kind of ancient political anything. Um, and unfortunately, I did not actually get to take his class. I, I, there was a, oh no, what was it? It was a, it was a class on ancient Greek sexuality. 
and I had a choice because it was my last semester of school. And so I said I could either take ancient political thought or I could take this ancient sexuality course. So I uh, I went with the sexuality course. It sounded very interesting. But sometimes I think, oh, I kind of wish I'd taken ancient political thought. Um, that's largely a development in my life well after graduate school. Um, and I suppose that's worthy of a kind of moment of reflection just to, just to affirm something which I think is not often enough said, which is that, I don't know, all of us in our lives, but narrowly let's just talk about academics. Um, that's, that's what we're talking about right here. You know, you're supposed to continue to learn and grow after graduate school, just as the kind of personal statement is a kind of calling card for people when they apply to graduate school. And for that matter, when you enter graduate school and you first meet the professors in your department, one of the things they know about you is, oh yes, I remember your application. You wanna work on this. You know, at the end of graduate school, people have written a dissertation and they go out into the world and they go on the job market and they're like, you know, hello, you know, my name's Cliff and this is my dissertation. Meaning something like, this is what I study. This is my topic. Um, and that, that is both a, a badge of honor and a, something like a burden because you go running around and everyone says, oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember you, you work on law and they name your dissertation or they'll name your book after you publish your first book or something like this. And, uh, you know, uh, that's great. And because of the way the U.S. tenure system works, people, people get very invested in their dissertation and their dissertation becomes their first book and if, if it turns out well, they get tenure and then they have a kind of, you know, then, then they have something closer to guaranteed employment, something like really very much like guaranteed employment. So it's, it's tremendously important, but as somebody who's on the kind of, you know, a notably later stage of the academic career, I, 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 I also want, I want in addition, not to replace that understanding, but I want in addition to point out that I, I certainly hope that the book you publish in, in, at the age of, I don't know, let's say 35, 33, whatever it is. I certainly hope that the first book you write is not your last, and I certainly hope it's actually not your best. Because um, uh, the whole point of our profession is that not only do we teach people, but we go on teaching ourselves. So, you know, I, my first book, my dissertation book, was a book at some level about, I guess, something like ancient politics in a kind of uh, vaguely novel way. That is, it wasn't about like people debating laws or rich elites talking to one another. It was about something kind of more, more abstract. Um, and then I kind of stepped aside from that kind of work and moved into much more, much more focused, much more on ancient religion for a couple of years, something really rather different before returning in essence to the study of empires and political cultures, in part via the study of law and how people, and about discourses of law as well as the actual functioning of legal institutions. But, but there was a kind of circuitous path that took me various different places. And um, it, would be, uh, it would be hard to overemphasize that as a kind of pleasure of the, of the academic career. You know, the ability to become interested in something and the opportunity having become interested just to dedicate some years of your life to learning something new is really, it's simply not to be underestimated. It's an extraordinary privilege. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I would think it'd be really cool to be able to sort of say, this is what I'm going to start out doing. This is what I, my focus is on. Oh, but guess what? I'm not a one trick pony here. I've got all this other stuff as well um, that you can develop over the course of a, a career, a lifetime as, as you teach, because one of the great, one of the greatest things, one of my favorite parts is that um, I, I love that you never stop learning in this capacity. Um, and I want to turn a little to, as someone who is in the field and who has, who knows the, the highly academic stuff, when you see it represented on something like in, in film, in TV, to try to bring 
all the all, all the knowledge and all the the yeah. ancient world to a, a more modern audience who may not want to go to school right. and and do all the the work required do are we doing a good job of of bringing and and now there's always the argument for i know there's things like the hbo rome which tries to capture the the political intrigue of the time um but i i know that there was some discussion of the showrunners were going for what they call authenticity rather than accuracy. Right. So just in terms of, you know, that sort of line of thinking, do you think that that is helpful or does that actually just sort of hinder the whole point of bringing the ancient world to life? Um, it's an excellent question. It really is. Um, to which I don't think there's a, a simple answer. So I think that a number of those representations of the ancient world in popular culture are actually, I, I don't know, I'm sure they're great. I mean, I, I, and when I say great, I mean great for classics. I don't mean just great in themselves, right? In a way, the ongoing popularity of representations of the ancient world, I mean, I mean anything from Troy to Gladiator to Rome is actually kind of amazing. You could say this. You could say it's the same is true even of some, you know, rather more kind of aesthetically narrow show like Vikings. You know, where you just watch people like bang on about each other and they would have blue hair or blue faces and things like this. Um, the representations of the ancient world in things like Gladiator and Rome are, you know, I I I I appreciate and understand the kind of authenticity or accuracy. So let's take Gladiator. You know, Gladiator. I'm, I'm, I'm not a specialist in some like ancient sport, combat sports, but there are a bunch of things that I'm pretty sure Gladiator got wrong. I could talk a little bit about them, about, about how gladiators actually function. Um, some of its representations of the aspirations of politics in the age of Commodus were insane. Uh, but there were other things that got profoundly right. The kind of sordidness of, of the imperial court, um, the possibility um, the precariousness of life and that actually, I mean, quite apart from Russell Crowe's character, the possibility that kind of random individuals could be abducted and turned into slaves just in the kind of streets of Rome was a real one. That people really worried about things like, you know, about the enslavement of people randomly in the countryside. The opening scene of battle in which the Romans fight these Germans or Danubians, you know, somewhere up north. Um, I mean, who, I don't know about the accuracy of any particular battle, but the Roman, Roman descriptions of these battles do basically say, we stood there in terribly disciplined fashion and these crazy unruly barbarians essentially slaughtered themselves by throwing themselves on Roman weapons because they were so unskilled. And the sense you get in that opening scene of both the violence of the battle, but also that the barbarians were doomed, that certainly fits a kind of Roman description in which the Romans come away and say, yeah, we, we had three casualties and they had 4,000 because, um, because, you know, we're systematic and they are not. So, you know, they're the, there's a kind of, I, I appreciate the authenticity argument. Actually, I actually think it's real. And I would say that, you know, depictions like that in quote unquote popular culture, fictionalizing representations like that exist alongside, you know, documentaries of many types. There's not one flavor of documentary. And here I'll come around to a kind of, you know, a distant professional acquaintance, you know, um, the, the, the writings and the, 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 the documentary work of Mary Beard, say, you know, surely the most prominent figure in, in, in Anglophone popular culture in this regard now. You know, one of the things that she does extraordinarily well when she touches on it, which is regular enough, regularly enough, is to talk about um, something like problems of evidence. How much evidence do we have? What does it represent? What, what is any one bit of evidence actually telling us? I mean, just to choose one thing which is more perhaps addressed to historians like myself than to popular audience, but you know, we have a lot of texts from the ancient world that tell us something about, I don't know, like early Roman the kings. It's a, I myself find early Roman and the Roman kings completely uninteresting, but an amazing number of people are interested in the story of Romulus and his brother and the one kills the other, blah, 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 early Rome and the rape of the Sabine women. And, you know, one of the things that, and the, the texts that we have to talk about this are written hundreds of years after. 
And all I will say is that Mary very usefully asks all of her audiences, professional audiences, student audiences, students, audiences in her documentaries. She invites people to pose the question or to, 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 to absorb the lesson. We need first to think about these as artifacts or as bits of evidence for the moment when they were written down. We need to we need to read them as you know documents of the age of Augustus before we treat them as transparent mirrors of information about a world seven hundred years before. And you would say the same thing about you know you and I, you as a student or myself as a professional scholar. We pick up some new book. You know, now I'm going to try to date these things. Shoot, I can't, you know, recently there have been a kind of like one book histories of Rome, Greg Wolf's, a, a superb book. And I was trying to think of an equivalent version 20 years ago, but you pick up these books, pick up a history of Rome every 20 years. They're not going to be posing exactly the same questions. And if you ask yourself why, one answer is, I mean, it, I don't want to be, I don't want to, I don't want to be too narrow in how we treat these complicated, intelligent people. But a book, a one, a one volume history of Rome is for all sorts of reasons, not gonna be the same book in 2020 that it was in 1990. And that's not just because we know more, but we in fact do, but it's also because you know, the questions we ask are inevitably the product of the, of, 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 of the society in which we are formed. And I don't see anything wrong with that. So that, that's, a, that's a great segue into, so speaking of texts that we can sort of take to be written in the moment versus, you know, how do we look at it now? Um, so at the very end of the podcast, I have each guest read Percy Shelley's Ozymandias. Uh, and it's, it's because it's, it's always been my favorite poem, but also to me, what marks a good poem is that it, it's kind of applicable and it fits the, the scenario at whatever time you read it, it's sort of timeless. So if you could read the poem and then tell me, you know, what are your thoughts? What does this evoke for you? Does this, um, you know, what's your take on, well, is it truly timeless? Is it something that when Shelley wrote it way, way back in the 1800s, it was it more applicable then versus is it still just great now? Um, okay, uh, yeah, Ozymandias. It's a, yeah, I, I, yeah it's, a, it's a phenomenal poem. Um, I'll read it and I'll say something about how I read it. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on those lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So you invited me to think about that and my first reaction was to read that in light of a different claim about ruins and, and how ruins speak to us. And, and there are other things one might say about the poem. Obviously, it is, it is, it is quite extraordinary, you know, not least in the mediation that the, the information about this shattered empire is brought to the, the author or the nominal author of the poem by report, not be a personal encounter. Um, and in a way you could make an amusing and but perhaps cheap analogy to how Americans love, love classics um, and the very different kind of love of classics that you might think is inspired by people who live in lands that were actually once Roman. And I've seen non-true, I mean, that, that's a cheap claim, but I think real one, but I think there's actually something much more substantive to be said about how people write about the Roman past in particular, my field, when they live in lands that they feel palpably once were Roman, rightly or wrongly, um, as opposed to people who live far away. Um, but the, the, my, my first reaction was to remember a passage of Gibbon, that is, um, you know, the uh, Edward Gibbon, 
the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, whose first volume was published in 1776. It's one of three great events in 1776. You know, um, the second was probably the publication of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, and then the third was the revolt in the American colonies. But Gibbon's history is surely the most famous and influential work of historical writing probably ever produced, certainly the, the, most, in, in, the most influential produced in English. And it's a, it's, a, it's a bizarrely intelligent and beautiful work. Many people have readings of it, interpretations of it, um, like the Shelley poem. Um, and I think it defies any single reading. But there's a moment in the first volume uh, when Gibbon writes, among the innumerable monuments of architecture constructed by the Romans, how many have escaped the notice of history, how few have resisted the ravages of time and barbarism. And yet, even the majestic ruins that are still scattered over Italy and the provinces would be sufficient to prove that those countries were once the seat of a polite and powerful empire. Their greatness alone or their beauty might deserve our attention, but they are rendered more interesting by two important circumstances which connect the agreeable history of the arts with the more useful history of human manners. Many of those works were erected at private expense and almost all were intended for public benefit. Now he goes on to say a great deal more, um, and, but let me just focus on two quick things. Right. Um, one is that for Gibbon, there is a kind of general issue. I mean, sort of a, a specialized issue, which is that uh, looking, you know, Gibbon looks back to a Roman empire that they understood to arise in something like a culture of um, Republican values. It, the, the Roman Empire was formed by a state that they understood to be democratic at its origin before it collapsed and produced a monarchy, but some, some spirit of something like republicanism survived, hence his emphasis on there and elsewhere, both in respect of Rome, but also in respect of those that they conquered, that um, the political culture of the place, the political culture may have been despotic in how it functioned internal to the government, but that its effects on the world that it ruled um, were focused, you know, in, in remained focused for at least another 200 years on the production of public goods. Um, so that for Shelley and the figure of Ozymandias, you know, who, you know, a, a figure he probably knows through Diodorus, that is to say, it's a report on an Egyptian and therefore at some level an Eastern or an Oriental despot, right? Shelley is looking back at one form of ancient empire um, in which the figure of the king, or in this case, the king of kings, dominates. It's a picture of Oriental despotism in which the vast resources of the political society are focused on the glorification of the individual at its center whose monuments, let us say, whether it's pyramids on the one hand or the giant reliefs uh, that the Persian kings, that the kings of kings carved in, 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 in near Persepolis and so forth, focus on an individual who even in artistic representations is larger than other human beings. And the, the traces left of that society, the totality, and in the self-understanding of the king, and in, this, and in the understanding of the artist who represented the king and his mission, the entire thing, the entire edifice was focused on the glorification of this one individual and his aspirations to, um, uh, to defeat the ravages of time and the irony, therefore, of his failure. And all the people represented in Shelley's poem know that, except for the perhaps Ozymandias himself, right? Because it says the sculptor well represented those passions or well read those passions. And then the guy who tells the story to the poet knows that that's the message to be delivered both by the object and by the ruins. And Gibbon, by contrast, um, shows that internally to the political culture of the Roman Empire, at least on his understanding, he, he's um, less cynical than we might be, but on Gibbon's understanding of the political culture of the Roman Empire, there may have been an inequality of wealth, 
but there was a culture in which the resources of wealth were to be redirected. At least some of them were to be directed back at the, I don't know, things like theaters and aqueducts, which brought water to the entire city, not just to, to say the king's palace. Um, and the ruins that we see don't testify to domination and don't amount as in Shelley's words to a colossal wreck, but testify to the kind of ghostly existence of the Roman Empire and the modern imagination of Europe, as he puts it, as a polite and powerful empire. And that's that's not just Gibbon's reading. That's a you know that's a reading that was meaningful to Europeans in the late 18th century, at the end of we might you know what we now call the Enlightenment, um, in which having survived something like a set of wars, the wars of religion and other wars within Europe in which um, Europeans systematically sought to kill and dominate each other. When in the kind of 18th century, a whole bunch of Europeans kind of tried to push back against the project of empire in Europe and to revive an interpretation, perhaps even the reality of Rome as a place that had not sought ultimately um, to construct a political culture centered on an individual and organized around extraction. Um, but to, or, you know, to, 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 to look back to, among other things, to a pre-Christian empire that was organized around principles of tolerance and public goods. You can be as cynical about that as you like. All I will say is that's a late, late 18th century reading of the Roman Empire that is exemplified by Gibbon but widely shared. And the 19th century to choose a cheap periodization, you know, the 19th century romantic reading of Rome, and for that matter, the 19th century romantic reading of Greece were very, very different than what you found in the 18th century. Um, and that transition from enlightenment to romantic visions of the different parts of the ancient world, you know, is a reflection of the historicity and contingency of our understandings of these societies. And we should therefore, you know, we should be, we should bring an appropriate humility to our own intellectual projects as we approach the ancient world. Wow. I mean, that's, I have not heard it interpreted in that way. So I, I love getting all the new different ways to think about the poem, uh, ways that I can continually go deeper, hopefully that other people, my audience, um, anyone who reads the poem can go deeper. So I definitely deeply, deeply want to thank you for your wonderful interpretation, because um, I always enjoy uh, anything. I really, it, it, I just, I loved, I could talk about the poem forever. Um, and, but lastly, I do want to ask, because that just sparked such, I, I, I can't let you go without, without asking, which is, if you were to look at society today, what is a modern Ozymandias? Is there a modern Ozymandias right now? Because for me, I would say, I would look at a, like an abandoned casino in Atlantic City and say, there's our modern Ozymandias. But what does that mean to you? You mean Ozymandias the person or Ozymandias the thing? Um, it, it could be either one. I mean, I would say base it off your interpretation. Um, for me, I suppose I look at the very immediate. It's when I read the poem, when I interpret it, I say, okay, well, to me, it's a, it's a picture of um, humanistic hubris. It's a look at the ephemeral nature of political power. So it's, sure. it's a memento mori, it's something that we're not meant to last forever. So to me, since that's what I think about, I say, okay, well, we look at these, these casinos and we, th we thought this was going to be the, the thing mm. that just kept on going. And then it sort of didn't. I suppose, I mean, it'd be easy to signal, it'd be easy to flag uh, political monuments of many kinds, whether in Eastern Europe or our own. Um, I suppose the probably the, I'd have to think of a couple of special examples. Let me just toss out the general idea that um, we've made a peculiar sort of God uh, out of um, technology. There was a very great historian of, of ancient and early modern thought named John Pocock, JGA Pocock, who wrote an extraordinary book about the it, it more, both broader and more narrow than this, but about the about the attitude that particular historical cultures brought to what he called finitude, from you know from the Latin word finis, meaning their boundedness, their boundedness in time, the fact that human societies fall. And uh, you could look back. I mean, speaking about Shelley, or you could look back at you know uh, another monument. You know, the the the, the opening of 
the opening of the history of Thucydides and his aspirations to have written a, a piece of literature that would be a monument for all time. And, you know, all sorts of different ways in which people at different social positions and cultural positions have aspired um, to push back against um, human finitude, as well as the finitude of their cultures. Um, common theme of popular culture, I don't know, you look at the movie, movie Prometheus, they usually, they usually get their comeuppance before they're done. And, um, you know, building something really big out of stone, so big you think it'll beat back the weather, so big you think it's too big for other people to knock down is one approach to this. And, you know, another is to continuously, you know, to continuously invent new technology. So rather than bigness, bigness is one, bigness is the fist that Ozymandias shook at time. And uh, ours has been to say, you know, I don't know, something like we're gonna craft ever more refined technologies we're going to, you know, we're going to refine our, you know, in the mid 20th century, we're going to refine our building techniques in the use of concrete. And we're going to build brutalist monuments out of, out of naked concrete and, and rebars that stretch into the sky. Or, you know, in the preservation of knowledge, we're going to build computer systems and, you know, we're having our floppy disks. And you, what happens to paper books when you spill water on them? Now we have a floppy disk and later we have a USB drive and then we have a, you know, somewhere along the way in between these, we had CD or DVD ROMs. Um, and uh, at least in the world of the preservation of information, um, these technologies have not proved as perduring as we thought. I myself own plenty of floppy disks somewhere in a moving box downstairs that I can no longer read. And I'm sure it would be an enormous trouble to find anyone who could read. And I certainly intended them to last forever. And I probably threw out all the paper, paper printouts of all the things I had, both because the floppy disk was supposed to be efficient, but because it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be um, durable. And we are, so our attention moved on and the technology itself didn't prove to last. Um, that's, that's definitely one of the more imaginative answers I've gotten. So I very, very much enjoyed that. Um, Cause I think I have like an old, um, I have a VHS player and then I have one that has those little tapes that you would uh, um, put in so uh i wanted to thank you so much again for joining me today uh, it was it was such a pleasure to talk trireme transit is now departing ancient odyssey next stop is present ponderings i met a traveler from an antique land who said Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. 